Good, so thank you very much. Uh, so this is the joint work with uh, Yaniv Teigman and with uh, Adam Poliak. So the goal of this work is uh, fairly simple. The input is a face image. The output is an avatar or an emoji or a cartoon. Compared to the, the first presentation, this is not a style transfer type of uh, task because the content has to change as well. Um, so we work in an unsupervised uh, manner, which unlike, for example, the second work that we've seen in this session. So we actually do use guns and use a lot of them. The inputs that we have in our system is a large set of unlabeled faces. This is the first input and a large set of cartoon faces. And we need something else, this is not enough. We need to align the two spaces, so what we use is a third input, which is a pre-trained network. In this case, we use the deep face network for this task. So we would like, given an input image in the domain S, in the source domain, to generate a new image in the target domain. So the input image is X, the generated image is g of x, we would like f of x to be similar to f of g of x. This is unsupervised in the sense that we don't have any matches between the two domains. We don't have this image in the source domain matches this image in the target domain. We have the function f, but f is actually terrible in the target domain. It was trained on real faces. It's no good on cartoons. So this is what we did in iClear 2017, and we were able to create images like the one that you see in the middle using a method that we call DTN, Domain Transfer Network, and the results are highly identifiable. You can tell immediately who you see in the image, but there is a problem, there is too much artistic freedom. It's not really part of the class that we seek to replicate. So in this work, we note that the images that we aim to replicate are generated by an engine. What is an engine? An engine is a mapping between a configuration vector and an image. And this is very common. For example, in the Bitmoji images that we see over here, you select the type of hair, you select the shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, and so on, and you compose an image. So there's a vector of parameters, all these little switches that you have to select, and the image is being generated. And this is actually a very common scenario, for example, in 3D computer graphics, there is a file describing the image and you get the 3D scene. The biggest advantage of working like this is that if, for example, we're able to recover the parameters on the bottom that enable us to generate this image from the images on the top, then we can use these same parameters and generate using the computer graphics engine many different views of the same scene and many different expressions and so on. So if we revisit the problem that we had, we still have two domains, we still recover a network G to map between the, the two domains, we still want F of the output to be similar to the encoding of the input, but we have an additional constraint. The additional constraint is that the generated image G of X should be such that there is a configuration U such that using the engine E, G of X is E of U. So putting all of this in a diagram, what we have is this situation over here. We have the function F which is given to us. We are going to use it as part of the, the network G. We have the network E which is the engine. This is also given to us. We learn two networks, G, and C. G generates the image. C is the network that given a generated image converts it into a vector of parameters. The main constraint that we have is that if we take G of X and we compute the configuration using C, we recreate the image using E, then we get the same image again. So basically the main constraint is that this image and this image over here should be similar. So if you take a closer look, you would notice that the networks G and the network C are actually collaborating. G would like to create images such that C can output valid configuration vectors, 
and C would like to create configurations that match the images of G. So it's a little bit refreshing to see in all this gun atmosphere, which is adversarial, some networks that are actually collaborating between them. If we look at this system of tied output synthesis, this is the way that we call it, it also inherits all the other constraints that we had in the DTN system in our iClear paper, including a gun loss on the generated image uh, G of X, and this F constant, the constraints that's, that is telling that, G, that f of g of x is the same as f of x. So looking at uh, some of the results, here we see a toy example with polygons. We see that DC gun does not really create the polygons. If we add a network C into the, into the computation, we are getting something that is much closer to polygons. If we look at face images and the emoji, you can see the input image on the left, then in the middle, you can see the image that is being created by the DTN network. It looks very much like the person, but it has too much artistic freedom. If you look on the right image, then this is the result of our algorithm. It's 100% compliant with the engine. Another data set, Celeb A, another graphics engine. In this case, this is the Oculus. A social avatar engine, given an input image, we can create the parameters of the 3D model and then show the 3D model from every pose and using multiple expression. So I described the system by telling you what is the loss of the system, but actually we also have a very comprehensive theoretical analysis in the paper where, for example, we are able to show that this problem, the tied output synthesis problem, generates both the image and the configuration vector. This is why we call it tied output. It's actually a combination on, of unsupervised domain adaptation and of the domain transfer network. And we're also able to show that the loss that we gathered is uh, well-grounded in the sense that if we derive a generalization bound for our problem, then the terms that we have in the loss closely match the terms that appear in our generalization bound. So to summarize, we propose a new method that solves a problem for which there isn't any other effective solution currently. There is a clear application value, but tying this maybe to the, uh, the work about the six degrees of freedom this is a mechanism for analysis by synthesis, basically. And therefore, it can be widely used. So if you look at the six degrees of freedom may I work from before, it used supervised learning. But let's say that if you want to do something similar using unsupervised learning, then we have all the components here for analysis by synthesis. In analysis by synthesis, given an image, you create an hypothesis. From the hypothesis, you create a representation and then you compare the representation to the image. Comparing a representation to an image is easy. This is just metric learning, what we've been doing for many years. Moving from hypothesis to a representation is also easy. This you can do with guns, or you can do with the 3D engines. What is really missing is an unsupervised way to go from an input image to a, a hypothesis, and this is exactly what we do in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? I cannot really see, but there is nobody approaching the microphone. So uh, I have a question. <laughs> uh, I think your framework uh, is really nice, and uh, it's actually a pretty general framework. I was wondering if you try to exploit your uh, framework of tied output uh, to other application, for instance. Yeah, so we're, we're actually looking at other applications. So in vision, for example, you can think about all the work that is being done about uh, hand uh, shapes, recovering of the pose of the hand from uh, monocular views. So this is as exactly the same type of structure. It is usually being solved using supervised learning with excellent results. But imagine that we can solve this using unsupervised learning. This is exactly uh, what we uh, are trying to do. 
We also think about other perceptual tasks. We have been working a little bit on voice uh, recently, where we are doing text-to-speech. So again, there is the text-to-speech, then there is the speech recognition. We would like to close some loops and maybe be able to learn text-to-speech and uh, speech-to-text with very little uh, supervision. So we are definitely looking to expand these two other domains. And I actually really liked the six uh, degrees of uh, freedom work uh, presented earlier. And I think that in robotics, such uh, unsupervised methods can maybe play a role. Question there? Oh, yes. hello. Yeah, beautiful work. Um, I was wondering if um, the, the work you're presenting, if it might resolve the problem that Vlad is seeing with his uh, with his current results, or if you could comment on how you would apply that to the uh, sort of segmentation to image synthesis that Vlad was uh, demonstrating had problems with GANs on. So I must say that I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. Could, could you relate this work to the work that Vladling Colton just recently uh, presented? I'm not sure to which work would you like me to relate this to? The synthesis work that Vladling Colton just presented. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that I'm not sure which work it is. I think the second work. Oh, okay, sorry. I was probably too preoccupied with, uh, with what has been uh, presented on stage. Okay. So uh, if we look at the, okay, excellent work. I was really impressed and uh, thank you very much for the computer, by the way. And uh, definitely generating with the perceptual loss is, uh, is um, a, a great way to go and we are actually working on uh, similar directions as follow up uh, now. But as I mentioned, the largest difference is that we are using unsupervised learning. If you are using supervised learning, then you have input, output, you can match the two. You might think that you need guns in order to define what is the best loss, but, um, but the perceptual loss that you obtain by training on ImageNet is actually a very uh, successful one, and it's very stable, it's just fixed. You don't need to, it doesn't change through the iterations, so you're able to train very effectively. The problem is that if you try to do unsupervised learning, then in this case, you cannot match at the individual sample level. You need to match at the distribution level. If you are matching distributions, then the problem is much, much harder. And in this case, you need to uh, find a way to model the distributions. GANs are excellent at catching discrepancies, which are the best way to work with the distributions. So GANs should definitely be used where sh they should be used. If they can be avoided, there are many reasons not to use guns. But unsupervised learning, so far, I think there, there isn't any better technique. 